Okay, so a very warm welcome um, to everyone um, before the weekend. Um, this is uh, the last session of the final conference of the New Horizon project this week. There is another week to go. Um, so our, we're midway through. Um, first and foremost, uh, just I would like to let you know that um, the session is recorded. Um, I hope that you consent. Um, uh, a very well wel welcome to our participants. We are 28, that's beautiful. Um, also, a uh, warm welcome to, to Jack Stilgo and uh, Simone de Borg. Um, I hope Eric Fisher, whom I don't yet see, but he's far away, he's in America. So I hope that he'll be able to join uh, eventually. Um, the, the schedule is as follows. Um, uh, Merve Jeromas, um, who is part of the New Horizon team from Fraunhofer ISI, um, will give an impulse presentation uh, brief um, to kick the conversation off. And then Jack, Simone, and Eric um, will join us. Eric is just asking for the link. So I'll mm -hmm. send him the link. Um, I think Eric is here. Just came, came in. Right? Yeah. Okay, okay, that's excellent then. So um, after Merve, um, Jack Stilgo, Simone van der Borg, and Eric Fisher um, will have a panel discussion. Um, Merve will end with a question, and that will be the opening for the discussion. Um, after um, a few rounds of um, discussions, I'll open the floor um, for anyone to participate in the discussion. We want to keep it as informal as possible. Um, also, there could be, can be a parallel discussion in the chat. So uh, please feel free to write in the chat and also not only questions, but answer each other. It would be nice. And uh, my colleagues will channel that into the discussion. And then um, at the end of the session, just before the end of the session, last five minutes, I would like to open the floor to reflect on the format, how we felt uh, both the panelists and the audience, how we felt in the online setup and uh, what did we miss or what was different, what was better, what was worse. So, so this is what's going to happen. While the title of the session is um, very ambitious, um, the philosophy of RRI, um, let's see where we get. Uh, mainly, we want to theorize um, RRI and see how such a theorization takes us forward um, in better understanding or better operationalizing um, RRI. Um, so with this, Merve, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, also, a warm welcome from my side to the audience and also um, to our three panelists. Um, so um, at the core of the reflections and the major questions of uh, today's session lies the relationship between science, uh, research, innovation and politics, and particularly the misconception or the myth of apolitical science. So um, science as a modern concept, um, we know often prides itself as being apolitical and uh, driven only by curiosity and excellence. And then there is this, uh, this figure of, of the scientist or this understanding of the scientist who is uh, disinterested, who is also apolitical and, and value neutral and free, which is a concept that emerged um, historically during the Cold War era and is embedded in, in the US context. And thirdly, uh, what we currently observe is that a politics is included under headings of impact or dissemination and not under uh, excellence. Um, so when we now shift our focus on RRI as a concept, uh, what we see is we do have, we do find values in RRI. So um, we know that RRI has emerged from uh, Western liberal values such as freedom, equality and participation, and that it is a concept that aims to create a bridge between science and society that 
wants to align uh, science with the expectations, the needs and the desires of society, and that it, it promotes an understanding of science that includes science and that works with science and that works for science. And um, in this context, um, the con uh, a project such as New Horizon or similar project in that field, or also, um, for example, the SWAFS program line as such, have achieved immense conceptual and practical work and have provided uh, immense evidence that this form of science and this type of science that is built upon these, these values and that is aligned to the needs, expectations and, and desires of society, that it can work, that it can be fruitful and that it can be successful. So um, in the approximately uh, 60 pilot actions that have been developed in New Horizon, what we have seen is that, that researchers, that scientists and all the stakeholders involved, they really want to engage with different publics they really want to engage with different stakeholders and that they are ready to interact and leave their ivory tower and to co-construct together with, with different parties, with different social groups, social experiments to address uh, societal challenges that are pressing, that are important. So the project uh, in, this, in this context has shown that, as I said before, that co-creation can work that such kind, such an approach of science can work and that it can be fruitful. And uh, what you might have heard in a lot of uh, preceding sessions where we have already talked about the, the many, many lessons learned and the narratives and the stories that these kind of activities and this approach of science in, in RRI can be a valuable source for learning, uh, for reflections and for help to mainstream RRI and be a valuable source for narratives, stories, and, and impact stories. Um, when we zoom out now a little bit and uh, look at our environment, uh, look at current uh, socio-political developments and the European landscape, um, the political landscape, the scenery looks a bit different and maybe even a bit um, alarming or frightening. Um, so what we're, we're faced with, um, with skepticism, with uh, distrust and mistrust in science, uh, we're observing anti-science movements, uh, anti-science attitudes and, and, and uh, streams. Uh, for example, what we have been able to observe in, in recent years is not only the increase of, of populism or um, populist power globally, but also the rise of, of conspiracies, of, um, of, of anti-science theories, uh, for example, related to climate, to climate change, to other topics, but also um, very recently, of course, the topic of, of the pandemic, where we are experiencing and observing a mistrust in, in vaccines. So we have this um, vaccine hesitancy and uh, we are confronted with, um, with an intensity of, of misinformation so that we may even uh, see or perceive this, this pandemic as a pandemic of, of misinformation. And uh, of course, these developments have, have multiple roots and multiple causes. And some of them are, um, of course, the development of the internet, um, the rise and the power of, of social media, where, for example, it, is, um, it has become very easy to, to spread, um, mis uh, to, to spread um, fake news or false information and, and conspiracies, for example, and where these things can get viral very easily. Um, other causes may be, for example, the innovation of Western neoliberal policies that pursue the ever-increasing liberalization of markets. So um, in today's session, we would like to take a very critical perspective on these issues and on those developments. And we'd like to pose the question or ask ourselves whether it may not be important, relevant, or maybe time to repoliticize research innovation. 
So um, particularly we would like to um, focus on researchers and communities role. That means on the community's potential contribution to the situation and to these developments and ask ourselves uh, whether maybe they might have even legitimized these developments and legitimized the status quo by directions or maybe even by the lack of directions. Uh, we'd like to address the potential failure of, of researchers and the community to anticipate or to appropriately anticipate, identify and respond to, to these developments, to these, to these issues. And secondly, uh, realizing or building on the, the re realization that RRI from a philosophical point of view is under theorized, we'd like to, to stimulate a discussion and reflection to change our perceptions of RRI, which we know, for example, as a, or which, how we use it. So we use it as a policy, as a policy ideal, or as a concept related to ethics. And in this session today, in our discussion, we'd like to, to, to stimulate a shift of perception to a philosophy of RRI or a political philosophy of RRI that um, in which RRI is a part of, of scientific excellence and that may be able to challenge uh, post-truth. Um, so coming to my, to my last slide, uh, before we start with our panel with our three invited guests, uh, I'd like to formulate um, our main questions for the panel. So first of all, uh, why could we, the RRI responsibility or also the uh, philosophy technology community not prevent post-truth to happen? Uh, secondly, uh, what should we do differently in the future? Uh, what could we do to, uh, to prevent the, maybe the escalation of these developments and mitigate uh, post-truth? Then uh, thirdly, how can RRI or RRI foster a more uh, political RNI. And uh, basically this means also, um, this is also related to the question um, how we could repoliticize science to address uh, the multiverse of truth in a post-truth era. And finally, what would the politics of RRI actually mean? So how would that look like? And this is, this is an overview of, of or a, comp a compilation of the questions we would like to address today and discuss with you. And I'm excited, I'm looking forward to the panel and I would like to hand over to you, Robert and Eric, uh, Simone and Jack. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Merve. I think it was a great talk and uh, gives a lot of food for thought. Um, uh, we're privileged to have an amazing panel, um, uh, humbling. Um, I don't think I have to introduce uh, the panelists uh, at length, Eric Fisher, Jack Stilgo, and Simona van der Borg. Um, so with that, um, let us start. Um, let us start with the, with the main question. Um, what should we have done and what should we do differently to prevent post-truths to happen. Um, however, um, I don't think we should dwell too much on post-truth. We would rather use post-truth as a moniker of the current state of affairs. And um, I would like to um, reflect on what Merve said. How can we re-politicize or politicize research and innovation? Um, maybe let's start um, in the reverse order of introduction. So, Simone, uh, let's start with you. Uh, yes. We would want to have it as open as possible so the panelists don't have to talk at length, but they can you know, jump in and uh, have a nice conversation. And then I'll open the floor to everyone else. Simone, the floor is yours. Sure. Are the other, other panelists there also? Because I don't see them. I was switching my camera on, but then... Uh... I didn't see them as well. Yeah, oh, great, great. <laughs> uh, 
Well, it was a great in introduction. I really liked it. And I also was provided some um, articles. Um, and I was particularly interested by the one on populism, and uh, which was saying, um, yeah, that populism was quite a threat um, to RRI. Um, so I was, was triggered by that a lot because it said that RRI emerged from Western liberal values such as freedom, equality and participation. And that actually, um, yeah, this was challenged by current pop populism, uh, but also that populist groups attack elitism uh, which makes it quite um, difficult to uh, uh, to talk about science at all. Huh? Um, so um, if you don't uh, trust the elite, then you probably don't trust what they come forwards with, including science and including RRI, by the way. Um, so um, and also that science and innovation are a global endeavor. Uh, which um, depends uh, on a globally established set of rules and norms and practices. Um, and um, uh, whereas the populists try to uh, focus on their own country very often and are a little bit more protective. Um, so I was, I was triggered by that and I was thinking, is it really true that populist groups do not accept the liberal values? Um, when I look at the populist parties in my own country, in the Netherlands, actually, these parties bring forward these liberal values in abundance. They say they stand for freedom. Uh, they say they stand for equality and participation. It's just really strange that um, they at the same time shut out large groups of the population and say that this, these values should be protected against newcomers. So, for example, against immigrants. And um, so what you see there in this discourse is, um, uh, yeah, is a kind of um, uh, a feeling of being threatened by newcomers and having to defend one's own tradition. So if you look at that, um, so this is one of the things that triggered me because I thought uh, perhaps we should also, um, um, going back to what Merva asked, um, what should we do and how should we look at this? What is an appropriate response to uh, less attention for RRI? And um, which also uh, comes forward from this uh, populist uh, development. Then I think maybe we should analyze why these populists are actually populists. Um, because if they share a lot of the same values, yet they... Um, uh, defend them in a very strange way, <laughs> in my eyes, at least, um, then we need to ask ourselves, what is it actually, uh, what we defend in RRI, what does it mean to actually discuss openly with each other about science and its relationship to society? Because um, there have been a lot of analyses within ethics, actually, uh, and pol political philosophy that are about the boundaries between staying um, loyal to traditions and moving away from those and opening them up towards more liberal discussions about uh, with people who dissent and who are not in agreement with the background of those traditions. And there are people who defend a little bit more the tradition and who defend that these traditions should be embedded in kind of institutions. So in that sense, you could also talk about the liberal tradition eh, and say we should defend that and institutionalize it, uh, just like a lot of the uh, populists say, or you could adopt a more free perspective, a more, well, we, um, yeah, um, usually we call that liberal, actually, um, which leaves more room for discussion, for difference of opinion, and which says, well, actually, which has a lot of trust in this rational conversation that we can have with each other about what um, the, the value basis of society should be and what the value basis of uh, science should be and what we should strive for, and which leaves, ro leaves room for difference of opinion and trust that if you uh, discuss with people who have different opinions that you might just come to a, some kind of agreement. But this trust, I think, is the thing that is challenged 
uh, right now. So the populists are not so much saying we don't accept the liberal values of freedom and equality and participation. However, they feel they are that these values are threatened by a lot of the newcomers in societies and they are threatened by the elites. Um, and that is probably what we should analyze more deeply and, um, uh, and then come with a response. Thank you very much. Uh, great uh, opening, a lot of um, words that matter. Uh, trust in the elite, rational, uh, societal trust. Um, so with that, um, I invite um, Eric or Jack, um, which of you would want to respond and come in? You're in charge, yeah. Robert. Eric, what do you I go? am in charge. Okay, I like that. <laughs> Okay, so then Eric, uh, I, I, I saw you wanted to say something, so go ahead, please. I was going to say Jack was, was smiling more than me, uh, indicating a slightly more eagerness, but I will take the mantle and um, also agree with Simona that uh, Merva's talk was, was very nice, excellent setting of the table, um, and I like the the fact that we have two proposals on the table. One is to shift from impact to excellence, and the other is to politicize um, science uh, and research. Um, however, while I like the first very much, um, it does come with risks, and we, we should realize the risks and the ironies, um, uh, but, but do that in an appreciative manner that, that sees the sort of uh, cyclical nature of history, where <laughs> when one has to sort of uh, the pendulum swings left and right. Um, and, and so, you know, um, the reason why impact came up in the first place uh, in, in, in sort of Western science policy contexts is that, um, you know, excellence was seen as something that was abusing impact, um, that excellent science is something that goes on and on and on, but it never produces its promises. It doesn't deliver on its promises. And as a matter of fact, um, the, the very political philosophy that can be said to underlie a regime of excellence, uh, Polanyi's Republic of Science, is by definition closed off to normative societal public values. And this was sort of increasingly seen as intolerable. But what happens when you uh, inject uh, impact? Um, well, then you basically start to politicize science. And, and this then, um, in my opinion, um, allows uh, the, um, the connection between science and policy to also be politicized. And there are different notions of politicization. Uh, I think uh, Rene von Schomburg's famous definition of RRI can be interpreted different ways. One way is that it's really a, you know, ultimately a mechanism to push forth solutions to grand challenges. Let's just get these things done, guys. Let's save the planet. Let's save ourselves and be done with it. But, you know, there's also a way to see his definition and vision as something that politicizes, not science, but politicizes science policies. Um, that basically says, look, since we can't all agree, you know, what the best uses of innovation are, let's talk about it. And in the process of talking about it, we're going to at least slow down some of the negative effects. And this is a good you know, mechanism. Um, it's a classic democratic approach that says, if you can't agree on things, maybe you shouldn't do them at least as quickly. However, both of these assume, in the first case, the grand challenges approach assumes that the terms of the debate are agreed upon. Yes, we all want to you know, save the planet. As Simona was saying, we all want democracy, wealth, health, security and justice. It's just that justice means different things to people you know, on the white woke uh, spectrum, right? The political left and the political right are going to interpret justice differently. So sadly, the terms of the debate are not in a post-truth populist, politicized, polarized society, they're not agreed upon. So we sort of have to shift then to Renee's second uh, you know, the, the second interpretation say, well, let's just talk about it. But sadly, I think in a, the very thing that defines post-truth is that not just the terms of the debate, but the constitution and the structure of debate, the possibility for debate is not on the table. 
So this brings us down away from substantive uh, uh, rationales for RRI into procedural, because I think these are this is all we have to fall back on. Um, and yes, it means that in shifting from impact to excellence, we will no longer be arguing uh, about what constitutes impact and which impact we should uh, sort of impose on the other. And let me just take a step back and say that Simona's call to analyze the roots of post-truth is very apropos and needs to be done in such a manner that recognizes the grievances, not simply the political manipulations um, and not simply the, the internet uh, infrastructure that, that sort of constantly amplifies the most provocative thing that anybody could say and gets that into everybody's heads. Um, but there's also a real sense of grievance and you can see this on the right and the left, right? And I think of this as the left behind versus the left out, right? Those who are left behind increasingly, uh, who, who essentially push to the right and those who have been left out for decades, centuries, depending on how you count, who, who push to the left and who the left wants to bring into the center. And if we fail to recognize that visions, normative visions that feel good to us and that our community holds to, if we fail to recognize that these themselves have been politicized and can lead to more polarization, then we will just keep pushing harder and harder down the same road. Uh, against the uh, the same, and we will, and we should expect more, right? It's the definition of madness to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. Um, so I think that um, while I agree that shifting to excellence is a good strategy, I don't think politicizing science is a good strategy because it basically will confirm what the right thinks it already knows, and what I think is probably true, and that is that in many ways. Science is itself an instrument, not just a policy, but of left-leaning policies, of progressive interpretations of liberal values. And this is, I think, largely undisputable, but it's sort of a blind spot to those of us who, uh, who agree with the, you know, the general uh, uh, normative interpretations. And so, um, you, you know, uh, the... The, the anti-elitism um, has a basis in at least two, uh, two roots that we should consider. One is the fact that, that science is not neutral <laughs> um, and it can be used to advance values that might benefit the left out but don't necessarily benefit the left behind. And the other is, is that, well, you, you have both of them right there. Um, you know, there, there, is, there are democratic grievances that um, are being taken advantage of to polarize uh, groups. And uh, the role of science is such that it has already been politicized. It has already sort of, you know, been seen. To quote Ronald Reagan's former Secretary of the Interior, James Watt, aren't, liberal uni aren't universities just liberal beehives? And I don't think anybody can disagree with that. Um, and so, um, so I think it would be a bad move to politicize science. But I think, you know, as, as Merva also pointed to, we have a lot to be hopeful about in the accomplishments and just showing how willing scientists are to nevertheless um, engage and co-construct. And I think that this is probably not limited to scientists. I think that if we had conversations with our neighbors, there might be some common ground. But this is the mode that we're in. We really need common ground. And this is why, you know, RRI means different things. And one of the things that it means is not a focus on substantive values, but a focus on procedural values. Procedural values of being willing to learn, being willing to tolerate the other, um, being willing to listen, being willing to incrementally uh, improve. And while this might be frustrating and it may or may not save the planet, it will at least preserve and possibly rebuild the political center that allows the debates to be had in the first place. And then maybe we can talk down the road about more aggressive substantive values. Um, and of course, it's clear that RRI can't do it alone. RRI is playing a role, but I think it, at the very least, we should adopt the physician's maxim of do no harm, um, 
Uh, and at best, I think we should build capacities for tolerance, for learning, for incremental improvement, for systems thinking, um, which can not necessarily immediately, but over time, help restore the political center so that we can actually have debates again. Amazing, thank you. Um, well, it's, it's, it's great that we shifted uh, to politicizing or not politicizing accidents, especially as Jack is coming up and he, I remember a little bit more than half a de decade ago, uh, wrote something against excellence. So I think he's the most appropriate person to ask, so let's politicize or let's not politicize excellence or, or just do away with excellence. Thanks, Robert. And well, thank you for inviting me. And it's a, a, an honor to be here and an honor to, to, to follow um, an interesting talk from from Merva and then two um, two brilliant uh, responses, um, and I don't you know substantively have, have have much to to add except maybe to I'll try and give it a bit of a sharper uh, political edge. So as as Robert said, you know I, I I wrote this piece a while back called Against Excellence because I grew more and more frustrated with um, excellence as a term of art in in science policy and my analysis was straightforwardly that excellence tells us absolutely nothing about what it purports to be about which is scientific quality and it tells us everything about who decides right and as a code word as a shibboleth for um, the ideal of autonomy that that Eric described from Polanyi and Veneva Bush and 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 others, you know, we should be clear about what policymakers mean when they use excellence. And I think if we want to hold science policy to account, we should not use the term, right? And we should challenge it when it is used and when there is a, a separation between so-called excellent science and grand challenges, then we should take issue with that because it's a it's a naked claim to autonomy and neutrality that we know um, cannot stand up. Um, I also think that it it provides a difficult, a probably unhelpful way into the debate about what we might call uh, post post truth, um, and I think probably. We shouldn't use the phrase post-truth either, because I don't think that's what's going that's what's going on uh, here. Not because, you know, of a of a you know relativist versus positivist debate about about truth. I'm not really interested in that in 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 political terms. I'm interested in looking at the populist attacks on science that did un that have undoubtedly happened. You know, around around Brexit. Um, around uh, COVID um, and looking at those not as attacks on truth, because actually we should remember that trust in the scientists to tell the truth remains extraordinarily high in, um, in most democratic uh, countries. Um, but we should, as Eric invites us to do, see those attacks as attacks on elites and see, um, the way that science becomes entangled in an elitist politics as a real problem for science. And there's a danger that if the institutions of science see this as a problem of truth, right, that the, that the prescription is just to get the message across better, right? It's to double down on truth and to um, move against democracy rather than, rather than towards, towards democracy. It's a classic, you know, the, the, the classic two narratives of science in, in, in the public sphere. One is of science as truth, the other is of science as progress. I think we need to um, problematize the narrative of science as, uh, as progress and ask exactly as Eric did, you know, about who has been left behind in the last dec few decades of, of progress and see the populist reaction as a reaction to those to those uh, new inequities. I'll just end with 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 two sort of two vignettes. The first one is about COVID um, and the second one is about artificial intelligence. So COVID 
you know, there is already a dominant story emerging around our interpretation of COVID that failures of policy represent a failure to follow the science, right? That, you know, where, where countries such as Britain and the US did not lock down early enough or strong enough, that was a failure to heed the message of science. Science cast as a sort of classic uh, Cassandra. Um, and that where the solution has come, that is of uh, science working at its best to deliver and develop uh, vaccines. And again, the reaction to the vaccines um, is seen as a sort of anti-science anti -science, uh, moment. I think all of those narratives can be and should be challenged because there's a danger that coming out of COVID in the same way as coming out of uh, the Second World War, right, where, where science acquired huge uh, social uh, uh, authority, which then earned it substantial uh, uh, societal autonomy um, after the war. There's a danger that the COVID moment refashions the social contract for science such that questions of responsibility and democracy become unfashionable again. Um, we can talk about a, a vaccine. I think vaccines is a, is a really interesting one. Vaccine hesitancy is a far more complicated matter than just whether or not people uh, believe the science. I'm speaking as somebody that is, you know, fortunate to be in a country where trust in vaccines is relatively high. And that doesn't tell you much about trust in science. It tells you quite a lot about trust in institutions. But my final thought is about artificial intelligence. So recognizing if we think that this that this diagnosis of the of the the social contract uh, for science and that the lessons of the last decade or so of experiments in responsible research and innovation have something to tell us how might we rethink our approach to artificial intelligence i spend a lot of time working with ai people um I'm currently running a research project looking at self-driving cars as a, as a test case for AI in the wild. What do I see? I see a huge amount of momentum, a huge amount of hype, right? The European Commission has just announced that it's going to invest a billion euros a year in artificial intelligence. Um, and still, I see no good answer to the question of who benefits from AI. Right. Or, or rather, I can see some some slightly sort of embarrassing answers. Right. I think artificial intelligence can easily be seen to serve logics of advertising, policing, surveillance, warfare. Right. I don't see that without an enormous effort, artificial intelligence is going to be emancipatory. And I think that really threatens the social contract for investments in artificial intelligence, right? If the European Commission is going to throw a billion euros a year at, the, at this area of science, and according to, its, according to its strategy, it is going to aim for, and I quote, excellence in artificial intelligence, right? Who's going to benefit from that? And what happens when European publics realise that the lion's share of the benefits are going either to causes that they don't agree with, or going to a small number of people. Final, final thought is to problematize the notion of ethics here, right? Artificial intelligence has been accompanied by this discourse of ethics. Ethics, I'm going to make no bones about this, I think ethics is a problem for responsible innovation, not a solution. I think ethics is a barrier to come to be framed around artificial intelligence. Um, and I think at the moment it's interrupting the sort of governance activity that needs to happen if we are to um, change the trajectory and innovation. Let me stop there. Um, I've, I've tried to be as forthright as possible, but I'd be interested to know what, what other people this think. Is, this is great, Jack. Uh, I agree with ethics as an obstacle. Um, and uh, maybe I can extend your question, who benefits, um, to um, what kind of world does uh, AI create? And whether is it the world that we want to live in? Um, and um, both or, or all three of you 
mentioned Polanyi and 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 Vannevar Bush. Um, let me push a little bit more provocatively towards uh, two of the uh, heroes um, I read often uh, that are missing from this uh, discussion. Uh, I think both are relevant. Feyerabend, um, who would um, who would call I think the liberal discussion of the elites around science anti-democratic and would want to see a more anarchist position within science. And then if we speak about COVID, uh, another hero of mine is, is George Ragan Ben, who actually thought that much of the policies that have been introduced, science-induced, are uh, biopolitically totalitarian. Uh, and although he was almost ostracized, uh, I think that he does have a point there. So, so isn't uh, COVID pointing us towards um, some form of, um, of scientific totalitarianism and uh, whether can we turn around the uh, trust issue and the uh, procedural approach of what Eric has suggested uh, towards more democratic, um, but also relativist anarchist, if you will, uh, positions. So what do you think? Should I, should I go first? Any, 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 I... any three panels? Think, so Please. just because they're two, two such interesting provocations, right? So I would take from, from your mention of Fire Arbund, right? I would, I would, yes, agree that or, or, or rather, I would, I would, I would wonder what an, a more anarchist approach to research policy might look like, right? Because actually, you know, the the claim often is that research policy is pretty anarchist, right? In that it is, in in that the absence of of, of top down controls means that you know this should this should just you know scientific excellence should emerge from the bottom up, it should sort of bubble up uh, to the surface. Now we know that that doesn't happen, right? We know that concentration happens in all sorts of different ways for social, for political, for economic uh, uh, reasons. So I would take the fire, you know, if we were to put a bit more of fire arbon back into research policy, I think we might restore calls for diversity. And excellence, again, seems to be the enemy of, of diversity because excellence tends to lend itself to, to concentration. In terms of Agamben and COVID, I mean, I disagree with his take on COVID. I think it's, you know, I think it's politically um, naive to, to, to see the responses in, in that way. I give politicians and policymakers uh, more credit than, than, than he would. But what will need to happen for his uh, prophecies not to come true would be a clear statement that the responses that have been made are emergency responses, right? So, and and here is you know if you imagine how artificial intelligence might get entangled into a new um, form of bio totalitarianism, then I mean yes, we have we have reason to worry, and we should take a gambon as a as a sort of as a cautionary tone. I just think that his diagnosis of, of what's gone on and why politicians have acted in the way that they've acted is wrong. So let me respond to um, Robert's provocations and um, suggest, well, first of all, let me um, say, I really appreciated Jack's, uh, you know, point, putting the finger on the question of who benefits from AI. Um, it's, you know, the story with past technologies, past emerging technologies that continue to emerge, like, you know, bio, biotechnology, synthetic biology, nanotechnology. Um, we thought they were stark when we were looking at them then. When you look at AI, you know, especially in light of the sort of dystopic effects of massive algorithms whose only job is to keep people on screen. Um, uh, then, you know, the, the question of who benefits, um, I think, you know, maybe two people in the world, and we call them, we say corporations, and what we mean are two or three people in the world are benefiting, or states, and it's not even clear that states are benefiting, but simply that some states feel the need to keep up with other states, because otherwise those other states will destroy those previous states. And, you know, this kind of logic, this realist 
political logic, um, you know, both has you know some you know has something behind it, but it also leads to it just leads down the road to its own form of totalitarianism. Um, you know, but I really think that if we focus on this question, we just ask ourselves again and again if, if RRI, um, and by the way, I'm using RRI because this forum uses the term RRI. As I said, RRI means different things, and you know, you can call it different things. You can call it RI. Um, and, um, you know, and so I think, you know, there's a lot of interesting confusion around that. But essentially, the, 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 if we can take responsible innovation, responsible research and innovation, and somehow embed at the core uh, this critical reflexive desire that some people think is built in, other people ask to have built in, one simple, if we'd learn nothing else, let us place that at the center of all RI and RRI inquiries, who benefits? And let us not answer that in advance based on those groups that we are aware are currently not benefiting and we think should benefit. But if we just, if we broaden the political discussion to say, well, let's have a discussion about who is benefiting and as elites and experts who we all are, let's make sure that our analyses and recommendations um, are attentive to this notion um, of, you know, of the whole. And um, I also think that, um, you know, Robert was trying to be helpful in saying, let's shift the question of who benefits to what world do we create? It's very fashionable. I, I, I live in a school called the Future for Innovation in Society. And, you know, um, our motto is, you know, uh, you know, the future is for everyone. So, you know, I, I understand the urge to say, what world does it create? But I'm hesitant to say we should replace who benefits with what world does it create? Because the idea of a future is sort of weirdly elitist and technocratic, or at least erudite. Uh, you know, what is a future, right? Right. Those of us who go to university and talk, you know, to other people who live in universities, we know how many different types of futures there are. But people on the street don't necessarily ask one another, "Well, how's your future going today?" Um, so, so, so not only does it have this elite sense, it also carries with it a possibly false sense of community, a happy sense that we all get together, we all agree. If we could just get those silly post-truth attacks on science out of our soup, then we could all go on enjoying things. And this also potentially sends the wrong message. So I hate to say it because it's a wonderful, you know, there's an entire world of futuring that needs to continue to go on that informs our work. But I think that's our turn. And if it helps with public engagement, great, but we should attend who benefits when we use this language. So really, those two words are what I'm going to walk away with, uh, and you know that who benefits is what should be front and center of RRI inquiries. Perfect, Mona. Yeah, can I say something too? Um, well, um, I really, I really like what has been said, and um, I like the two things that Jack brought forward, saying um, about AI. Uh, saying um, that is serving causes that people don't agree with and who is the benefit, huh? which Eric also brings forward as the central question. And I would like to bring that back also to the other um, provoking um, <laughs> statement that has been made, <laughs> namely um, uh, that ethics um, should be a kind of enemy of RRI. And I think that's so interesting regarding the whole conversation now and where it's ending, saying that RRI should be about the question, who is to benefit, which is, in my um, perspective, a very ethical question. So uh, first of all, we need to find out what the different people consider benefits, right? So if you look at the con concrete AI robot, for example, intended for agriculture, what I'm working on now, you see that the different stakeholders think very differently about what benefits it would bring. And it, um, and it um, raises the question, how do we, how do we balance all those benefits and how do we make a decision about them regarding which uh, ones should be guiding the further development of this robot or the way it's going to be implemented? Um, so um, I, I do see a very important role for ethics there, but I always see that a lot of the social scientists have a lot of a strange idea about what ethics does, which is um, 
partly true when you think about kind of old fashioned principalist ethics. But um, if you look at it uh, from the perspective of more, yeah, which is more uh, in agreement with a lot of the social science perspectives saying that morality is kind of overlapping with the social world and that ethics only is needed when there are uncertainties about what values to use to guide your actions or, um, or, uh, or when there are clashes between values um, and, uh, and that those are the situations uh, that demand ethical reflection, then I think actually um, that we're doing that all the time in our RRI. <laughs> and um, that especially when we focus on questions like who is to benefit, that this is a very ethical question and that we are dealing with different perspectives to what benefits are of different people. And we're dealing with that all the time. So, um, and, uh, and I think who is to benefit uh, from AI? Um, I mean, that's also our, our job, right? To um, find out for the different examples of, uh, uh, for example, AI robotics and push um, the types of initiatives a little bit further that we consider um, uh, actually valuable uh, for society and actually helping the people, uh, well, the people, which people, um, <laughs> Uh, um, maybe um, they're also, uh, we're being a little bit moralist sometimes that we find that the people with the least power should be most um, uh, supported. Um, uh, so um, perhaps we want to bring those forwards also a little bit. And, um, uh, and, and that's also um, a question that maybe we should consider, like, why is it why is it that we find that most important and uh, what are our arguments for it? And why is it bad that people with the big money push technology forwards? I mean, these are, in my perspective, all very ethical questions. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to open the floor um, to um, not look elitist uh, to our audience as well. Uh, so. Please, whoever wants to jump into the discussion, please feel free. Um, I see one uh, uh, hand up. Uh, Matthew, uh, please go ahead. Uh, and also those who are, who are um, commenting on the chat, if they want to bring their uh, comments to the, to the fore, please do so. So Matthew, the floor is yours. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for this great event. And um, I just wanted to follow up on Simona's point. I think I, I agree. So I'm I'm professor of responsible innovation, but my background is a philosopher, and uh, I attended because on my calendar it popped up. It said philosophy and RRI. So, and not to make too much of that, but I think um, this connects to Jack's mentioning of ethics as a problem. Also, I think on the RRI side as well, we don't really have um, these words like impact, excellence, democracy. They're sort of they're not really making the most of the philosophical tra tradition in the sense of the normative range of normative questions we can be asking. So I'm curious if it's, is it possible to sort of reanimate the philosophical spirit within RRI, which means sharpening the questions, um, not sharpening in the sense of more detailed, but sharpening in the sense of being very clear about what are the normative ideals that we're considering. For example, what is right knowledge? What constitutes the human or person in, um, in a techno-scientific world? And then what constitutes collective human flourishing? So these are, I mean, there are other core questions as well, but I think sort of the impoverishment of these uh, normative awarenesses leads to problems on ethics, but also on RRI's uh, side of things. So I'm curious, you know, what that would mean to, to reanimate this philosophical spirit and if, if that's desirable at all. I don't think we can answer that in uh, the time left, half hour. Uh, At Attila, um, floor is yours. Please go ahead. And if anyone wants to answer uh, Matthew's um, proposition, please go ahead also. Thank you. Uh, I, I have to start with two caveats. One is that uh, even Bright was playing a game with me, so I, I missed the first few minutes of Mary's introduction. So I might have not understood certain things or might have misunderstood certain notions. 
And the other one is that I'm a, a newcomer to RRI. My, my field of research is innovation, innovation systems, innovation policies. So this is the background of my uh, sort of, I don't know it's, it's, whether it's a question or, or um, a cry for help. So when uh, not only Merva, but other colleagues were also sort of undersigned the idea that uh, we should politicize science, then, then uh, I, I, I feel or I hear uh, an alarm ringing because uh, my understanding is that it, it would be important to make a distinction between uh, analyzing and understanding the political conditions of uh, scientific activities and perhaps uh, trying to create uh, the right conditions in, in quotation marks for uh, RRI or in a broader sense scientific activities as, as part of our political activities, either directly in, in certain movements or, or trying to push uh, various organizations, either NGOs or political parties, or when we are casting our votes. So there are various ways. But politicizing science for me is, 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 is really a dangerous term. Uh, we, we should understand that, uh, I think it was Jack who who was talking about uh, the use of, and in a way, Jack as well. Uh, uh, how to use the results of, of scientific and technological activity. Uh, yeah, the results of these activities. But that's, that's a different question as opposed to the question how to conduct scientific activities. And when we conduct our, I, I guess most of us are researchers. So we all know very well that when we conduct our scientific activities, we, we, we have to uh, comply with, with the rules of scientific research and, and not, not to mix it with political activities. So politicizing science means something like that for me. And, and that for me, it is really a dangerous term. Thank you. A worrying one. Anyone wants to reflect? Jack. I can jump in. Yes. Yeah, so, well, let me start with a, a with Attila's provocation because Attila, I mean, it, you know, the, the concern that you're that that you're expressing seems to me to be, you know, a perennial one in 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 research policy, and it and it it go you know it goes right to the heart of the debates that people like Polanyi and Bush were were involved with. Right, where where their their thinking and their call for the autonomy of science and scientists was in the context of a Cold War that featured um, the explicit politicization of science. That I guess is a sort of a, that's politics that's politics with a capital P, right, and often often partisan or or geopolitical. Um, I think the call to politicize uh, science policy is to introduce questions of political philosophy rather than to draw connections to particular uh, parties or or political movements. So it's a small p politicization in 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 that mode. Um, I would also take issue with the with the distinction between you know the results of science and the conduct of science. Right? If you take my example of the European Commission deciding to invest. A billion euros in artificial intelligence. That seems to me to be about both the results of the expected results of science and the expected conduct of science. Ultimately, we we have to have a conversation about directions and 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 priorities, um, which which I think means you know which means challenging the sort of linear separation between inputs and outputs to to, to science. And then to Matthew's um, question about, and 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 following uh, Simone rightly picking me up on on you know what I what I'm considering to be to be ethics, and I guess here, you know I'm I'm attacking ethics with a capital E, right? So even though we would all agree that questions of the good life, questions of um, of, of of benefits and justice 
are ethical questions, right? They are very much not part of the way that AI ethics with a capital E is being constituted, right? It is being constituted in very narrow terms about privacy, individual rights, with and downplaying principles of, 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 of solidarity, justice, and other things that we might want to want to include. So while I'd, I'd totally agree with, with, with Matthew and Simone's call for, you know, an expansion of the conception of ethics and the human within RRI and within research and innovation more broadly, um, my critique is of a very instrumental framing of of ethics and you know i know i know why it's happening and it's not the ethics that we in this room would want to see or regard as important it's extremely convenient if you're you know the owners of of the oligopolistic ai powers eric yeah, thanks, Jack, for that clarification. I hope Simona um, feels better um, <laughs> because I think you, you said it really well. We all, of course, subscribe to the uh, the the importance, the you know, the central meaning of human activity that includes some reflection on the good life as well as the pursuit, and uh, for lack of a better word, uh, the irrational or systematic pursuit of the good life. Um, and you know, but at the same time. Um, once somebody insists on a particular uh, vision of the good life and associates that with ethics, then we're in trouble because we've got politics with a big T, ethics with a big E. Um, uh, however, if we sort of keep alive the core, right, uh, which is what, you know, what, what we can call a certain type of philosophical reflection or ethical reflection or reflection, or even have other words because even the word reflection, as, as many of you know, my work, you know, is, you know, a lot of my work involves going into places of scientific and engineering uh, and entrepreneurial activity and trying to induce structure, encourage uh, reflection. But this very idea is somewhat, uh, is met with resistance initially. And I don't even call it reflection. I definitely don't call it ethical reflection. <laughs> I certainly don't call it re reflection on the, the role of good life imaginaries and future, you know, perceived futures, right? Um, uh, so, so, so my point is that we want, we, we all can band together and agree that what ethics is meant to provide and uh, um, promote a certain type of uh, philosophical awareness uh, in a sort of pragmatic context of moving forward, um, is, is that's, that's a good, that's a quality, that's part of the fabric of RRI. But it's the framing. The framing is vital because that gets us into the realm of politics, that gets us into the realm of polarization, that gets us into the realm of politicizing the means to accomplish the ends of a special interest group and to leave others behind. Um, so what sort of seems to be coming to the fore uh, from our discussion so far in this, this first hour at least is that there's sort of a need and perhaps uh, an interesting movement to redefine ethics, redefine excellence. We could say we should redefine excellence such that it includes what in the old days would be called ethical reflection, but right in the sort of post post truth days, won't be called ethical reflection because that's something right that draws attention to itself immediately as a technocratic practice, as a professional practice. Um, but if we can redefine excellence so that it includes these incremental procedural values of reflection, learning, tolerance, inquiry, curiosity, broadening, the broadening that is sort of at the root of constructive technology assessment and the root of some of the early philosophy of technology uh, calls for more reflection, uh, plus respicera, as Carl Mitchum would call it. Um, if we can redefine ethics so that, uh, sorry, excellence, scientific excellence, so that it includes not the ability to fill out a checklist, not even the ability to generate a checklist, and certainly not only the ability to generate funds through generating checklists that you've promised to check off at the beginning 
of your project when you receive those funds, but something else, something that's more incremental and ongoing uh, and, and is focused on broadening. Uh, then I think we've really made a contribution. So, you know, this question of, of who benefits, quo bene, at the, at the center, uh, you know, uh, again, it, that, you know, not necessarily literally something that gets tattooed on the heads of every scientist, right? It, it's, you know, framing is all important, guys. The message is the medium. The medium is the message, right? It's how we frame Right. I think the, the goals, you know, provocatively, I can say the goals we have that we're talking about now are in many ways no different than what motivated Rachel Carson, Carson in the 1960s, the, those who were protesting against, you know, uh, nuclear uh, weaponization in the 60s and the 70s, you know, the, the early roots of technology assessments and environmental policy, environmental impact assessments. You know, going on through you know through anticipatory governance and and whatnot, the goals haven't changed, the sensibilities haven't changed, but the framing has to change, um, and of course the apparatus has to change because you know things are accelerating. But it's really these core questions of flourishing that Matthew was was pointing to as well um, that we have to not just repackage them, but figure out how to embed them in the core of the, the machinations um, that otherwise are simply gonna march us off of an AI cliff. Who would want to follow up uh, on whether we're falling off the cliff or whether we're flying? Well, so I wanna, don't want to ahead. dominate because uh, <laughs> there are lots of people there who may want to speak as well. So if you do, please raise your hand. Um, but I, I agree. Um, I, um, I uh, like this idea of redefining excellence. However, I do think that um, if, uh, yeah, this is not a particularly new perspective to ethics. <laughs> I want to say if, if we the, for the ethical part, um, because it has been, yeah, this approach to ethics um, as contributing to human flourishing has, of course, been part of ethics since uh, Plato <laughs> and it never disappeared. So the kind of checklist types of ethics um, have generated much later. Um, yeah, and it's uh, always been part of it, too. But um, I, I guess it's. Um, um, it's a richer field, perhaps. But um, uh, I completely support um, Eric's idea that uh, we should focus also on the what he called the earlier the procedural val uh, values. And now you had it, you gave it another name, but I forgot that. Um, working on tolerance, on learning, on um, uh, letting other people speak, on a capacity to argue for things, and um, um, I. Uh, I completely support that, and I uh, I think that's um, that's really um, important, and and you might think of that also as a kind of capabilities, or uh, if you want to uh, use an uh, ethics term, virtues that probably belong to a liberal world. Um, you need to become capable to do these kind of things in order to be engaged, uh, to engage in these um, types of open discussions and leave room for others to bring forward their ideas, even if they disagree with you and to uh, leave them there for a while and <laughs> uh, tolerate that they're there and then challenge them without being afraid that you would get in um, arguments or something. Um, so, um, um, so I think this is a central um, quality that um, we would need to foster in ourselves, but also, um, yeah, uh, probably um, when we engage people in conversation, that we should think about how to uh, how to develop dialogue sessions in which um, people feel comfortable enough um, um, to open up like that and to be tolerant and to talk. So, um, so I think that's an important one. And another, I mean, we focus now all the time on this, but there were other topics as well. 
and in this um, article also on uh, populism, what was said also is that, um, uh, well, this, this discussion with the elite, huh? So I was thinking now, if we are talking like this, and that's really great, and we have this whole international community together, and um, and we find this very normal eh, since a while already. Um, but um, uh, when I was still studying, when I was a student, uh, we all worked in our own language, and um, we wrote things in our own language, and we were participating in societal discussions um, uh, in within uh, in the newspapers and um, in um, around the corner in their own communities, and nowadays uh, we have a lot more difference between the discussions that we engage in in our work. So in the uh, in the academia and um, and the discussions that are taking place in society, and um, I think that is probably less so if you're. Um, native language is English, but if your native language is not English, um, then this is the kind of the new Latin, you know, that we're talking in, in academia. And uh, in former times, um, there were philosophers like, uh, for example, Descartes who wrote in French in order to open up towards um, the people and to uh, make science more popular and philosophy more popular in order to allow people to learn and to engage with it. And right now, actually, I think this is part of the problem that we have a lot, um, yeah, split now um, in a lot of our countries between uh, what um, the societal discussions are about in our own countries and the discussions that we engage in in our academic work. Um, especially because we want to publish and then we need to attend to problems that transcend our own countries and our own communities. And, um, and also we make it inaccessible to a lot of the people in our own countries who don't speak English um, that well uh, and who don't relate to these larger questions perhaps that are international but often American or at least Anglo-Saxon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, that, um, yeah, um, that is not the type of questions they are always engaged with. So I think this is probably also uh, underestimated, maybe. Yeah. So that's a different. Uh, uh, that's a, that absolutely. I, I, I love this um, just uh, to open up um, how much uh, the lingua franca of science, both in terms of actual language, English and actual language of jargon, but also the, the whole setup, the whole institutionalization of science and being the son of my father, who is the founding father of Scientometrics. Um, I, I am privileged to be in the RI community and not in the Scientometrics community. Um, but I think they, with all the good intentions, weren't aware, they being the Scientometrics community, weren't aware what kind of monster they're creating and what will be the consequences of the, the publication regime that then they measure and they create a science of science as it is called now. So, so you know, we have two English speakers on the panel. Uh, so what do they think? Um, um, you won the war of uh, creating the lingua franca. Should we become Descartes again and write in our own languages? In, Will we get still positions in major universities? Well, putting that aside and whether we talk ourselves out of a job or not, and whether that's a good thing, um, because of course we're smart enough, we can create new jobs. Um, I mean, that your last comment really does get to the heart of what keeps people frozen in place and keeps them in an old fashioned excellence regime. Uh, Attila's point is well taken that we don't want to politicize throw the baby with the bathwater, right? We don't want to politicize science to the point where it just is seen as more of a tool than it, you know, you know has always been. Uh, but at the same time, we really need to, um, you know, uh, encourage the kinds of, of transformations that, that are needed uh, to, to avoid the sort of projections that we're all desperately aware of. Um, and I love Simona's call for what I would call a new Vulgate, right? The, the Cartesian move 
to open things up is just one of many moves to open things up. Um, and I'm reminded of a contrasting move by Isaac Newton when he was trying to get the Principia out and he didn't want one of his chief competitors, I think Dr. was it Robert Hooke? Uh, it was Hooke, uh, I forget his first name. Um, but Hooke didn't have a classical education, Newton did. So what did Newton do? How did he present his Principia? Not using the language of algebra, which Descartes had largely helped uh, bring to the fore, using the language of good old Euclidean classical geometry because he could refer or not refer to propositions which poor Hook had to go scrambling back and, and relearn in order to keep up with Newton's reasoning. So, you know, lawyers do this, <laughs> uh, everyone does this, right? Academics do this by profession. I think uh, if you live on the continent and you speak in a sensible way, you're automatically suspect among your colleagues, at least so So my continental colleagues call, uh, tell me. Um, uh, you know, this never happens in the US, by the way. But in any case, um, the the new Vulgate, uh, you know, and I like, Simona, that you've you've referred both to, in my mind, public engagement activities, as well as what I call expert engagement activities, right? That, that there needs to be an, a new Vulgate where we bring highfalutin terms like ethics and futures down to a level in which they become capacity building uh, uh, um, mechanisms, um, both for publics, to you know, think about uh, their participation in, in, in democratic and other political regimes, but also for scientists to think about how they can redefine excellence such that it accords with their deepest commitments and values, which go beyond simply fear of being having their paychecks cut off. Can I just add a, add a reference to, so we, talking about language, um, whether that is, you know, the the national language, international language, or jargon versus accessible language, that you know, the, the obvious connection to a live research policy agenda is to the the question of open access, right? Which is treated often as a pragmatic question: How do you ensure that somebody who wants to download a PDF can download a PDF, right? But behind that debate sits a political discussion within science about what the institutions of science think science is for or think published science is for who they imagined the audience who they imagine the audience is as in just the same way as you know who the imagined audiences of principia mathematica or the translations of the bible were right open access that debate reveals a huge amount about you know whether science, whether institutions of science think that mostly a scientific paper is to be read by other scientists within a narrow discipline, or whether legitimately, you know, other disciplines, members of the public, people in the global south, have a a need, let alone a right, to um, engage with that with that material, or if there is some other separate channel of science communication imagined imagined for that. And it's strange that we don't talk about that more in the in the European debate about open access. Couldn't agree more, Yannick. Please turn on your camera and uh, your mic. Yes, go, go ahead. Yes, hi. Well, thanks for the. <laughs> For the the debate my head is about to explode but uh, we had uh, two quick comments i want to make we there was a kind of spin-off discussion in parallel when the idea of scientific totalitarianism was mentioned and the one point i wanted to make is this issue of of timing this is more related to practical questions but uh, so yes we're at a time where science is uh, uh, its trust is being eroded uh, on one hand, by populist groups, and on the other hand, improved with the vaccine uh, vaccination story, fine. But we also have an urgent global crisis unfolding, both climate and biodiversity related. And uh, as in my book, we have just this decade to so sort of solve it, right? So when I say the issue of timing, is there still time for uh, for this uh, RI in, in, in science. Uh, in a way, uh, this scientific totalitarianism might be 
a, a, a necessary approach for some time. Although in the, in the discussion we were talking about also the potential for citizen assemblies to actually uh, spin together very quickly actual solutions to grand challenges. So that is perhaps one of the way forward. The second point I wanted to make is I really take away this idea of looking at who benefits, making the winners and losers clear. I think it's a great point. Um, and, uh, but to me, if I think of it more, it doesn't solve much because then we still need to decide which winners, who should be the winners and losers, especially when it comes to the balance between present and future generations. Uh, the democracy as we know it today is very much about the interests of those who are alive now, while the grand challenges that we're trying to tackle are really slow unfolding problems that will affect, if not us, uh, future generations. So should science then have an opinion about that? And did you mean something along those lines when you say that science should be political? These were my two points. Oh, Eric, you Eric go ahead. Thanks, Yannick. Um, I, I think I, I agree that on some level there, well, there's a choice, but then there's also a strategic choice, right? The, the sort of the goal-oriented choice is, hey guys, I'd like to keep the planet around. We've only got 10 years to do it. Clearly, um, the current state of political uh, democratic discussion has not gotten us closer significantly to the policies we would need to do that. Therefore, we need to choose not democracy, but some form of totalitarianism, some form of, right? So this is the strategic move. All right, so you have to choose between democracy and sustainability, okay? However, the political scientist in me says, ah, and who is we? And how does one choose this? If you're Joe Biden, do you say, hey guys, I'm moving us forward. And by the way, we're not gonna have midterm elections because then I'll lose my majority and I won't be able to pass a single piece of legislation. No, <laughs> right? It's not clear who the we is in the totalitarian move. So this brings us to this, no this notion of the politics of the possible. There's only so much we can actually do. We, you and I, uh, any particular world leader or group. So one has to choose. Do you band together with your groups and communities to try to assert a sort of scientific totalitarian sustainability-based regime? Okay, you can do that, or you can say, gosh, that's not sustainable politically. Our only hope is to do it by democratic means. Time is running out. Yes, we have to double down and build the capacities that Simona is talking about that I think comes out of this vision of redefining excellence um, and not politicizing science uh, with a big P and hope that we can retain the center, retain uh, the ability to, uh, to speak and live and act together, as Hannah Arendt would say, and at that point, make decisions about who benefits that truly benefit the whole. But only if those who are offering these solutions are not framing them in such a way that they appear to only benefit their group or their side of the political spectrum. So let me just, let me just add to that, Eric, because so, I mean, the first thing I would say is, you know, I think the answer has to be more democracy, not less, right? There, there have been plenty of calls to say that climate change demands in some way a suspension of some of those freedoms um, because politics is so woefully bad at engaging with those long-term questions and the rights of future generations, as, as you described, Yannick. But, you know, I think it's also, it's a mistake to imagine that there is a possible way forward that might seem like the scientific way forward. Right. I think. And that's a sort of category mistake in terms of pretending. I mean, yes, we can say that there's a relatively strong consensus identifying a global challenge, right? The global challenge of climate change. That's not at all the same thing as saying that there's a consensus that maps out a scientific way forward. Right. No such thing exists. So if you were to put science in power, right, and suspend democracy, whatever that might mean, there would be no ready-made strategy does that mean you know are we giving it to are we giving power to the ipcc right they don't really do 
policy strategies. They do the analysis of the of the problem. Are we giving power to Elon Musk, right? Who talks about climate change and he's got a strategy, but you know, electric cars and moving to Mars might not be a world that we all want to want to live in, right? So I think we need to be. I think as soon as you start to ask even the most basic questions, political science questions of of that mode of of of, of, of moving forward. Um, it starts to unravel quite quickly. Thank you. Um, I was fearful of this moment because um, time is uh, coming uh, short for this discussion. Thomas, um, I want to give you the floor. Um, and then uh, before we close and before Merve uh, says her closing statement, um, if anyone wants to jump in reflecting on the format um, and uh, the online version, of uh, meeting, then that would be very welcome also. So Thomas, the floor is yours now. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I must say that uh, my point was already also kind of answered by uh, Jack just now. Uh, but what I did want to add is also in this discussion about um, how we will tackle these grand societal challenges that we still have, there's also, there's a whole range of futures that we might still have. So aside from how we will get to a certain point of how much uh, carbon we will have in the air, it's of course, um, do we want at all costs that we reduce um, uh, climate change to one and a half degrees, for example, and who should then reduce this? Um, I think that there are still a lot of distributional choices that we have to make about which countries will uh, change their societies by how much. And I think that this is where the democratic uh, discussion is very vital so that we will not say, okay, here in the Netherlands, it's just way cheaper to build a large sea dike and then, uh, then we will be fine. Um, so I think that because there's such range that that is where you need to, yeah, to, to discuss this democratic. I agree, Thomas. It's, it's politics all the way down and the values don't go away, unfortunately. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, Mervet, uh, the floor will be yours in a moment. Um, would anyone want to say anything about the online versus physical? Um, if not, then the floor, Merva, is yours to close. Uh, Thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And Merva, the floor is yours. Um, yes, Robert, thank you. Can you see my screen? I hope so. Yes, we do. Um, so yeah, first of all, I'm overwhelmed by this uh, discussion, by, by all your contributions and by all the points you raised, the, the very fascinating additional questions you brought into the discussion that we weren't, maybe we didn't think of before. And I think, so I'm a bit overwhelmed by all the activity going on in the chat. And I think um, or, uh, we have heard that your uh, heads are already exploding. And uh, to make it maybe to, to keep it short, I just tried to, although it was very difficult because you talked about so many different points and you raised so many important questions and all in a very, very critical manner. I just tried to, uh, for also for reasons of time to just uh, wrap up some or just summarize some of the, the, the major notions that you addressed and you agreed on. So you started with, the question of the of the populists and the, the populist camps have been threatened and you reflected Simon on the, their protectionist attitude and how so how we actually can find room uh, in this in this environment for, for different opinions uh, so I just want to go very quickly through them so maybe there might be some other final comments uh, in the chat or in the from the audience uh, we agreed, or you, you talked about the, the, that it is imperative to, to analyze the roots of populism and post-truth. Uh, we had very different um, debates and discussions about impact and excellence and the shift towards excellence, uh, its potentials, its risks uh, in different contexts. Uh, what, 
maybe become one of the most central questions of this discussion is the question of the benefits, the beneficiaries. Uh, you talked about that in the context of COVID, trust and science also uh, intensively in the context of AI. Uh, what you said, Eric, what, what I thought um, is very important and very um, valuable and is also connected to the last point so that we should place the question of the benefits really at the core of our view and of all uh, of our view on RRI and RNI and all the inquiries related to that. Um, we had very inspiring discussions on the notion and the perception and conception of excellence, how we should redefine these things. And uh, I think a very important, uh, the focus was on really changing the framing and focusing on broadening that and on broadening as a concept. Um, very also what was very important, um, of course, the notion of ethics, which you uh, proposed uh, Jack to, to question and that we should uh, question this notion of ethics, uh, was you also described as being instrumentally framed. Mm, as you, so the usage of excellent science and also problematize the narrative of science. Um, another very important point was ethics, which was discussed and seen as a barrier, which you all agreed on, and a problem rather for RI, not a solution. And uh, just final, some final remarks um, from a rather positive point of view, what you said, Eric. So you addressed that there is hope, you addressed, or you talked about the achievements that were done by RI. There is still um, being done and that we have to focus really on procedural values, on, on learning and build those capacities that allow for this to find a common ground, to also tackle uh, the first point, for example, the populist threat or crisis related to these ideological developments. And then we, we need to have the ability to learn, to listen, to make incremental improvements, to be able to restore political centers and have really make, um, make space to have open debates and to discuss all these things. And uh, yeah, I think this is maybe only a very small snapshot of all the points you discussed. Um, I would like to thank all of you. This was a very, very uh, inspiring session. And I would like to hand over back to Robert for some final remarks. No, no remarks for me, just thank you. Thank you for everyone. Uh, Thank you, Simona, Jack, and Eric for participating, taking the time. And thank you everybody for the actually pretty enlightening uh, discussion in the chat, which will be saved uh, and, and all the other discussions that took place. Thank you so much for participating. And as a good Austrian, let me say, have a nice weekend because that's what we all live for uh, after all. Uh, so thank you very much for participating and see you next week. Join our sessions and see you somewhere either in virtual or physical reality in the future. Thank you.